If listening to Unforgotten has inspired you to create your own podcast, you're in luck. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can make your own podcast and share it with the world. And the Spotify platform makes it super easy to get started. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter where you are when an idea hits, you're ready to start recording. Spotify for Podcasters makes it easy to distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Plus, you can do video podcasts and engage with fans through Q&A and polls. You can even earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's free. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com slash podcasters and sign up for your free account to start recording and sharing your podcast with the world. Hey guys, and welcome back. Before we get started, we thought we'd mention there were a couple of case updates in the last few weeks or so here in Alabama. Most notably, I think, at least to our team, was the discovery of who everyone agrees is likely Aaron Toole, James Aaron Toole. We covered Aaron's case in episode 19 and spoke with his granddaughters, Mandy and Ashley. And for those who haven't been following or haven't listened to the episode yet, Aaron had disappeared in 1995 on his way to visit family in Florida. His family, particularly the two granddaughters, have been trying for years to find him. On Wednesday, September 27th, this year, in 2023, crews were cleaning up at a boat ramp at the Steinhatchee River in Florida after Hurricane Idalia and found pieces of a car. Soon after that, they located some remains. They actually found either a license plate or both license plates, I'm not sure, that matched his car. And his ID card and a SAMS card were also recovered. So they do have to go through the whole process of DNA testing, which unfortunately, as we know, it takes months. It could even take more than a year. Mm -hmm. But they do feel pretty confident that they found Aaron. As long as it's been, you know, one of the things that I think a lot of people thought was, oh, my gosh, why just now? But you know what it reminded me of was Mm -hmm. the Kyle Clinkin scales. Yes. Where they found his car in the um, river. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. Just what, at the beginning of this year? And it's like, I guess there's just sometimes the water levels just change drastically. Yeah. And I know that when you have big storms like that, sometimes water levels get significantly lower than what they would be. But it, there's been other hurricanes that have come through here. So it, it just blows my mind yeah. it that it just had to shift did take things this just, long. Yeah. Yeah, right. It's amazing. I mean, water is such a crazy animal to work with. Animal is not the right word, but but it is really odd. I mean, you find all kinds of um, things that people discover after storms and unusual weather, you know, that sort of thing that they would have never found otherwise. Yeah. Well, you know, Captain Bonner said something um, in our conversation with him about, you know, sometimes it's just not the right time. That's exactly right. Yeah. For some reason. Maybe that's just what it is, you know. Yeah. We may never know why it took this long, considering that it was found in, the car was found in the water along with him. Yeah. And there have been other storms that came through, but there's a reason that it was found now versus then. So, yeah. But at least it gets to be brought home now. Another sort of development, although I don't think anything really came out of it recently, was that there was a search out in West Mobile, close to where Brittany Wood was last seen. That's right. Outside of it popping up and us getting a lot of messages about, hey, they're searching around this area. We haven't seen anything out of it. No. And from the articles that we've read, nothing actually came out of that search. Um, they didn't find anything. There were a lot of rumors that there was. But there were a lot of rumors yeah. that floated around. It was, that there was all over the place. 
But I, as far as we know, nobody's been back out there. It was only maybe a day or two. Right. Um, and you would think that if anything had been found, they probably would have already been back out there. Yeah, I agree. Um, so nothing else has been said about it, but obviously they are taking tips seriously and following up on those. So if you have information, call Mobile Police Department because they were just out searching and um, they will clearly follow up on it. Right. Yeah. Also, the indictment of Bridget Matthews in the disappearance and murder of Bubba Jackson, Charles Jackson Jr., We shared Bubba's story on our social media pages last summer. He was last seen walking towards Highway 158 with a plan to visit his girlfriend in Citronelle, which was a very long walk. That's like nine hours from where he was at. Um, It was, yeah, it wasn't very close. And they had gotten him on gas station surveillance around 1 p.m., And then I think around three hours after he was seen on that surveillance, he sent a mass group message to his family stating that he was walking and felt like he was going to pass out. And then a short time after that, he sent another message in that group text message saying help. And no one had seen or heard from him since then. And that is broke my heart because... yeah. Can you imagine, especially, I don't remember who all was on the group text, but I'm sure it's like his parents. Knowing that that's the last message that went out, like, uh, I just, uh, when I read about the the indictment, I thought, man, you have to be worried in general when you can't find somebody, but then to know that that's the last message that they actually sent, and then all this time has passed. There has to be some kind of almost like relief to know that maybe there's going to be somebody held responsible for this. But still, you kind of go back, you think about, oh, is there something I could have done? Like, mm-hmm. why? how could we have changed that? I think that's probably something that a lot of people probably go through. You, pro- you know, you just think about things all the time. Right. Every scenario goes through kind of like, you know heard that a hundred times yeah yeah it yeah it just it, it actually breaks my heart might just yeah yeah anyway although they have made the indictment of matthews they have not yet found bubba's remains or shared that they have authorities have stated they believe there are accomplices that help matthews hide his body in westmobile And that additional arrests could be made potentially in the future. Well, I hope that they do that soon because these people, you know, now that they know what's going on, or at least somewhat what's going on, they need answers. The family needs closure. Well, as much closure as the family can have. And, you know, it kind of came out of the blue. that It did. That this arrest was made. It was not something... You see cases talked about a lot of times, and you think, like, there's going to be news coming on that any day now. And so, mm-hmm. or at least, you know, if there's been movement in a cold case, sometimes you'll see some news coming out hinting towards there's been some movement in it. And this just kind of came out of nowhere. And so, it's interesting to me that they think that there are other people involved like they must have gotten some really pretty detailed information yeah i do agree i mean one they seem to kind of have a good idea where that they he may have been hidden and you know i don't know that they would have said that had that they not had more you know information to kind of at least partially confirm that and maybe part of the arrest or the indictment and everything coming out now and the fact that they do believe that there's accomplices, maybe they're hoping that that information being made public at this point will encourage somebody who may have been involved to come forward, maybe in order to work out a plea deal, like offer the information that they need to find him. That's, yeah. 
Next week, we'll be in Madison County, but today we're bringing you this month's cases uh, to remember and share our October remembrances. And as always, keep in mind that as you hear each of their names and listen to the summary of their cases, if you remember any piece of information, please reach out. We'll have the contact information for each case in the episode description as usual. We ask that you help us to keep their names out there and support the family's efforts to find resolutions for their lost ones. Lonnie L. Taylor 78-year-old Lonnie Taylor was last seen by acquaintances on October 24, 2019 in Jasper. He was at the housing authority complex where he lived off of Old Birmingham Highway. Her name is he was known to walk through the woods as a shortcut to a nearby Walmart and was frequently seen walking through town. Lonnie did have a car, even though he seemed to prefer to walk more than drive. It was located after his disappearance on or near some property belonging to a niece. She stated that she had borrowed the car around October 13th and just had not returned it yet. The housing authority is offering a $1,000 reward for information leading to Lonnie's whereabouts. I think that's awesome that they did that. because I know that is that they like stepped up and put that money up. I think Mm -hmm. that's great. It kind of makes you think that maybe, I mean, if he's in housing for, from the housing authority, they probably don't have a lot of resources as Mm -hmm. family maybe. So that's wonderful. They did that. I thought. It it says a lot about them. I think, Mm -hmm. you know, I do too. Lonnie is described as a white male who at the time of his disappearance was approximately six feet tall and 180 pounds with thinning gray hair and brown eyes. He was reported as an endangered senior due to a health condition which could impair his judgment. Those who know Lonnie described him as a sweet man and stated that he liked to work for free in the yards of the elderly village in the Walmart parking lot. If you have any information regarding the disappearance of Lonnie Taylor, please contact Jasper Police Department at 205-221-2121 or the Secrets True Crime Confidential Tip Line at 205 282 Lisa Marie Wallace. 30-year-old Lisa Wallace was last seen near her Chihuahua Creek Drive home in Eufaula on October 27, 2012. She and her husband, Chris Wallace, had had an argument and he had stated that he left the house around 1 p.m. to take their less than two-year-old daughter to his mother's house. While he was gone, Chris reports that Lisa had packed a bag and left home on foot. However, according to family and friends, Lisa had been a domestic violence victim at the hands of her husband since early in the relationship. They frequently urged her to leave Chris, and though it was said that she had started to change her mind about this after the birth of their daughter in 2012, she never did leave. At the time she disappeared, Lisa was also suffering from a brain tumor and was to be undergoing a second surgery for this condition in December of 2012, less than two months from the last time she was seen. Her husband, Chris, took a turn for the worse after she disappeared. In 2019, he was a suspect in a local pharmacy robbery. He and a female companion were pulled over by an Auburn police officer and subsequently shot the officer and drove off. They were tracked to an apartment where Chris reportedly had committed a murder-suicide upon himself and the companion about the time a fire also broke out. There's quite a bit to this disappearance, so we encourage you to listen to episode four of Unforgotten, if you haven't already, to hear a more in-depth coverage of Lisa's case. And I will say that we did get a message from Lisa's mom after we did the episode saying that maybe there were a few things that needed to be clarified or corrected. Mm -hmm. And I asked her if she would send us, you know, a list of things that we could amend or correct or clear up, and I haven't heard back from her yet. Um, So I'm not sure, but I think for the most part, it's pretty accurate since most of it came from public resources. And if you're listening, please go ahead and um, just a reminder, if there is something we need to amend, let us know. Lisa is a white female with red hair, hazel eyes, and standing about 5'2 to 5'5 and 145 pounds at the time she was reported missing. She had a mole on the top of her right foot a tattoo of a dolphin on her upper left arm, and pierced stairs. She could be using the last names Emmerich or Walls. Her maiden name is Altamari. 
If you have any information regarding the disappearance of Lisa Wallace, you can contact Ufala Police Department at 334-687-1200. Richard Michael Harden. 25-year-old Richard Michael Harden Jr., or Michael as he went by, was reported missing on October 24, 2012, after reportedly being last seen riding dirt bikes near the abandoned Fabius Coal Mines in Flat Rock, Alabama. After a multi-day search, Jackson County Sheriff's Office confirmed they located Michael's body in the same area he was last seen. According to the autopsy, and confirmed by investigators, the cause of death was accidental drowning, but his family disputes this and has made multiple requests to have Michael's case reopened after a witness came forward alleging that Michael was murdered by a group of men. To our understanding, Michael's case has not been reopened by Jackson County Sheriff's Office. For more in-depth information, we featured Michael's case in episode 21 of Unforgotten, where we discussed the autopsy findings and thoughts from the family. If you have any information about Michael Harden's case, please contact Jackson County Sheriff's Office at 256-574-2610 or submit an anonymous tip on their website, which will be included in the episode description. Michael Sean Boyette 28-year-old Michael Boyette was last seen near Hilltop Road in Grand Bay on October 17, 2007. At the time of his disappearance, Michael was experiencing some difficulties in his personal life in the middle of a divorce. In his distress, Michael stopped by a family member's home. Understanding that Michael was upset, the family member tried to console him, but Michael ran from their home and into a neighboring wooded area. Captain Paul Birch of the Mobile County Sheriff's Office told Lanyap that earlier in the day, Michael told his family he was going back to where it all started and that deputies had responded to an attempted suicide call with Michael the week prior to his disappearance. Michael's mother did talk with WKRG shortly after he disappeared and stated that Michael did have a history of drug use and some suicidal ideations and was worried because of this that his case would not get the attention it should. And, you know, we've talked about that many times with, you know, those that have drug use. A lot of times their cases just aren't taken quite as serious, um, let alone anybody who... Or criminal, like any kind of criminal record or anything like that. Sometimes Mm -hmm. they just kind of get pushed down the priority list. Right, yeah. Doesn't make it right. It's not not fair, so... Yeah, but it is fact that it happens. Mm Mm-hmm. Almost 15 years later, Michael's whereabouts remain a mystery. Although Michael is listed in NamUs, he is not listed in the Aaliyah database. His family members have confirmed that he has not been located. Family members have searched the area where he was last seen, but to the family's knowledge, no official searches have been conducted by law enforcement. Michael is a white male with brown hair and brown eyes. He's approximately six foot tall and 175 pounds. Michael has several tattoos, including his last name, Boyette, across his chest, the face of a demon on his right forearm, a Lexus written on one wrist, and Aaron on the other, unsure which wrists are which. Top left arm has a skull with flames. He also has unknown tattoos on the back of his legs on his calves. Michael would now be 44 years old. If you have any information regarding the disappearance of Michael Boyette, please contact the Mobile County Sheriff's Office at 251-574-8720, or you can submit an anonymous tip at their website. Richard Earl Trimble 42-year-old Richard Trimble, also known by the nickname Zero, was last seen around midnight on October 8, 2007 at his home in Wetumpka, Alabama. Richard was said to be with his friend Joey Dell Ward, and they left Richard's home traveling in a blue and tan 1987 Ford F-150 pickup. Joey Ward was seen shortly after Richard disappeared and was supposed to come in to be interviewed by the authorities to let them know what he knew, if anything. However, Joey never showed up and is also missing to this day. Joey does have active warrants out for his arrest on burglary and theft charges, though there's nothing that's been presented, at least publicly, that those charges have anything to do with what occurred on October 8th. Richard's family can't make any sense of what happened. Richard was well-liked and well-known and married with three children. 
They say he would have never left his family, and his brother shared with WFSA that he is a U.S. military veteran, though we haven't yet been able to confirm which branch he served in. At the time of his disappearance, Richard was described as a black male with black hair and brown eyes. He's approximately 5 foot 9 inches and around 165 pounds. He is believed to have been wearing a blue shirt and Nike shorts at the time of his disappearance. 16 years later, Richard is still missing. He would now be 58 years old. If you have any information regarding the disappearance of Richard E. Trimble, please contact Elmore County Sheriff's Office at 334-567-5546. Kimberly Nicole Arrington 16-year-old Kimberly Arrington, or Kim, vanished without a trace on October 30th, 1998. Kimberly's story was also featured in an unforgotten episode, episode two, back at the first of the year. On October 30th, at about 5 p.m., she left her home headed for the CVS on Forest Avenue and 3rd Street in Montgomery. Kim's sister, Jennifer, who was 14 years old at the time, says that Kim asked her to go for a walk to the store with her to get some candy and a soft drink. But for some reason she can't recall, she didn't go. When Kim didn't arrive back home by 5.45, her parents became worried and went looking for her. But by 8 p.m., they contacted the Montgomery police after not finding her. At the time of her disappearance, Kim's story was on many of the major talk shows, but soon her story seemed to fade from the public eye. While investigators initially considered her a runaway, which, as we frequently discuss, is so unfortunate, this is mm-hmm. what the, often is the first theory for teenagers and preteens, and that just yep. drives us crazy. Yes. <sighs> What frustrates me the most about that, Mm. though, is that even if they are runaways, they're still minors and they, okay, as an adult, you have the ability to make that decision, Mm -hmm. but as a minor, you don't. Right. And if their family comes in and they have reason to believe that their child is gone without their permission and, okay, I'm just going to stop because I'll end up getting on a soapbox. Yeah. This is one of those cases where we talked about the differences between coverage And granted, this was in 1998, but still, Mm -hmm. this is one of those cases where you would think there would be a lot of coverage and continued coverage even over the years. And there just hasn't been. Yeah, I agree. I think we're fortunate that people are starting to, you know, like out in social media, you know, content creators and influencers and other people out there that are sharing these stories Mm -hmm. are really trying to call attention to that and make sure that, um, You know, people don't just refer to them as runaways anymore. So I think we're fortunate that maybe we're turning a corner on that. Aaliyah lists her as a missing adult, which of course she is now. But I mentioned this, that some of the missing children from years ago are still listed as missing children. So, you know, I just thought that was worth mentioning. Aaliyah also states that she was last seen at the CVS. However, other articles and missing person sites don't confirm that she ever actually made it to the CVS, so I'm not sure which information is correct. We'd like to think that Aaliyah would have the most accurate and up-to-date information, but we're not sure whether that's accurate. Kim attended high school at Jefferson Davis in Montgomery and was an excellent student who enjoyed school, especially computers. Her friends say she was fun, always in a good mood, and friendly to everyone she met seeing the good in everyone. Many of her friends and actually family speculated could have made her susceptible to being taken. Her sister suspects that she may have been picked up by a human trafficker in hopes that maybe she's living out there somewhere else due to this, even if that's the reason she's gone. Kimberly is a black female with black hair and brown eyes, approximately five foot two to five foot four inches tall and 110 pounds at least at the time she disappeared. She has a small surgical scar on the left side of her abdomen and suffers from severe allergies. She was last seen wearing a gray Bugle Boy shirt with a collar, light blue Levi jeans, white Reebok sneakers with a gray trim, pierced ears, and an emerald ring with two diamonds on each side. She also possibly was wearing a double heart ring set with a diamond. This particular ring was only listed on the Charlie Project page, so I'm not 100% sure if she was wearing that or not. 
Kim has gone by the name Kimberly, Kim, and Kiwi as a nickname. Mm, that's cute. I know. Isn't that adorable? I, I think that's so great. And has three age progressions through NCMEC. The last one was about four years ago at age 37. This year will mark 25 years since Kim vanished. That's such a long time. 25 years. It is really a long time. She will now be 41 years old, and there are still no clues as to what happened or where she may be. And unfortunately, her mother passed away in 2005 before knowing what occurred to Kim. And uh, there was an article that actually mentioned that just before she passed, she had talked to her her husband, Kim's dad, Walter, um, that she wanted to make sure that he was still going to be looking for her, that he promised her that. Oh, that gave me chills. I know. Her father and her sister, who actually named her own daughter Kimberly, still search to this day. You know, we actually asked Montgomery Police Department for a status on Kim's case, and um, that was one of those, Kim's case and a couple of others, actually. Mm -hmm. Um, And we're told that it's not their policy to publicly state um, or publicly comment on ongoing investigations. Right. Which is kind of disappointing since it's been 25 years that they can't or won't provide an update. Right. I mean, even if it's just to say, you know, yes, it's still active and open and we're receiving, you know, we're still open to receiving information and tips. I mean, Mm -hmm. they could just simply say that at least, and they won't even do that. Or if there's just some kind of information that, you know, maybe they could just release some information that wouldn't be detrimental to the case. Like they could review the file to see if there's just something that maybe wasn't known at the time, but is known now that wouldn't change the outcome of the case if it were known publicly. Right. Um, To help jog memories. I think about that a lot and, all the cases, actually. but Yeah, I do too. If you have any information at all about Kimberly's disappearance, please contact Montgomery Police Department at 334-241-2651. Thank you for listening today, and thank you for being an advocate for these missing and murdered persons and their families. One last reminder for today, please share their stories. And if you have any information about these cases, please step forward and make contact through the information provided in the episode details. We look forward to sharing Madison County cases with you next week. Since Alabama Cold Case Advocacy's creation, we have dedicated innumerable hours to researching and networking in an effort to provide the largest platform we can to the cases we share. We shoulder all associated expenses with Alabama Cold Case Advocacy out of our own pocket including the subscription fees for researching and production of the Unforgotten podcast to provide a cost-free avenue for the victims' families of those cases. We hope you will join in our efforts to raise awareness of Alabama's missing and murdered and support these families who have been forced to carry the immeasurable loss of their loved ones and the fight for answers. If you appreciate our mission and you are inspired to make a donation, your extra support will enable the ACCA to continue our research share the cold cases, and help those families know that they are also unforgotten. Be sure to join our Unforgotten Patreon channel today to gain exclusive benefits, including early access to ad-free episodes and bonus content. By subscribing, you'll also be supporting the efforts of ACCA in assisting families in raising awareness for Alabama cold cases. Unforgotten is an Alabama cold case advocacy podcast recorded in conjunction with Riverside FM, hosted and distributed by Spotify for podcasters, available on your favorite podcast platform. Intro music for the show was created by Principles of Uncertainty, who also mixed and mastered this episode. Content and production is by Sellers and Stormy. Artwork by Sellers. Credits for music, sound clips, special mentions, and any source referenced in our podcast can be found in each episode's description. We hope you will join us on all the major social media sites and continue to raise awareness of our Alabama cold cases. Until next time, thank you for listening, and remember, justice may be delayed, but the victims and their families remain unforgotten.